Welcome everybody and thanks for uh, attending today. And, and today our topic is going to be store lighting and how it affects packaging and design and, and some of the different things that, that people do to, to work with it and make that workflow work. So my name is Ron Ellis. I'm a consultant. I'm based in the Northeast. Uh, and I do a lot of work with brands. I do a lot of work with printing plants. So I'm bouncing into this lighting issue quite often and bouncing into the, well, very often what is the unknown about lighting because these brands very often don't even know what their lighting is and, and where they should be looking at color. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, I'm also a print properties chair. And uh, that means that I get to work with a lot of really smart guys like Danny Rich and, uh, and Jim and others in the industry who build the standards that we work with and, and actually understand the, the science behind all this. Uh, I'm a G7 trainer and a brand Q trainer. And uh, we're going to start, I'll start with just a quick intro of who our panelists are today who are great. So uh, first one is Jim Summers. And Jim Summers is, is VP of GL Optic and Juice Normalic in the Americas. Uh, he has a big background that goes over 30 years in lighting, color management, print, and uh, has done a lot of it. And uh, he's started a bunch of startups and worked with many, many other companies. He used to uh, kind of run GMG in, in the U.S. too, and that's where I had first met him. So he's going to be our, one of our panelists. And very often I have him give a really cool little presentation on lighting uh, at our brand Q classes. And it's, it's pretty unique, very different than probably what people have mostly seen. And then our other presenter is Danny Rich. And Danny Rich is uh, a doctorate, so he's PhD. He is, you know, truly a color scientist because a lot of people call themselves color scientists, but he actually really is. Uh, and his PhD is in, in color. And he's worked for Sherwin-Williams, uh, other companies, and he's been for quite a while at Sun Chemical and directs the color research lab there. He also uh, is active in ISO standards. So any question about standards and ISO and anything that I have, I always ask him. And it's great because the knowledge he has goes way back to, you know, somebody did something in 1960, which relates to what we do today. And that type of stuff is, is amazing. Uh, so before we start, I'm going to give you just a little teeny bit of information about Brand Q and what it is, and then we'll move right into talking about lighting. Oops, Oops. sorry. So our, our uh, agenda, we're going to start off. I'll speak first for a few minutes, then I'll have Danny Rich talk and uh, share some of his thoughts on it, and then Jim Summers. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for a question and answer where you guys can Anything you've ever wanted to know, these are the guys. Like if it's in lighting and if it's uh, related to lighting, these guys know probably the most about it of any people that I know. So Brand Q is the Ideal Lights program that's focused on helping brands in the supply chain work together. And the three big ideas for Brand Q are communication, helping the brand communicate what they want to the supply chain. Education, helping them understand the language of, of uh, color and print and how to work with it. And then validation, being able to see if printing is good or bad so that you can check what you asked for and, and see if you achieved it. If you look at Educate here, this is one of our brand few classes that we held. Um, we've had uh, four of them so far. We have one coming up in two weeks in Korea. And we have uh, some others coming up at the end of the summer in pretty good locations that are almost done. But anyway, you can see these are uh, print buyers here and designers, and they're basically sitting here, and you can see they're measuring and learning how to measure and talk about color and work with color. Uh, communicate, being able to actually discuss this and understand it. So this is at that same class, and you can see one of the print buyers has brought in samples, and you can take a look at the samples here. And they're talking about a problem with a pastel color and how to, the measurement versus the reality, and, and what do they do about that. Uh, validate is where we measure, and these are, you know, print test samples. They learn how to read, and they learn how to measure, and, and what does color mean, and what's appropriate for the type of work they do. So that's the Brand Q program. But today we're going to talk about store lighting, and I'll, I'll talk just for a couple minutes, and then I'm going to let these guys talk because they're really the real experts. But as somebody who deals with this working with brands all the time, the standard for graph guards lighting is D50. 
and that's based on the ISO standard. But one thing that I notice is that D50, to me, appears to have much more UV energy than real life lighting, meaning things under D50 don't look the same as under store lighting or under, uh, you know, even just sort of normal office and household lighting. But D50 is the standard, that's the viewing booth. When we're standing at the printing press, that's what we're looking at. When we're in the viewing booth at an agency or, you know, in a brand, that's what we're looking at a lot of the time. But the, the key thing here is the store lighting is different. And there's all sorts of studies about how the lighting affects people's perception and how they actually buy products based on that. So there's some pretty neat studies of that. But even within stores, as you walk around, the conditions within a store can vary pretty pretty light, or it can be vary pretty greatly as well. So this first thing you know to keep in mind is there's a big disconnect between the lighting standard and what actually happens in the stores. If we look at an example, and I'll just give a quick example with one of my customers, is I, I go in there and uh, I'm set to go in there and help them profile devices. Sometimes they're for prototyping, sometimes they're for proofing, sometimes for design. But I'm sent in there to do it. And one of my questions is, where do you guys look at color? And very often when I say, where do you look at color, I'll get a response like, well, what do you mean we look at it right here? And here is usually a room full of designers with a bunch of big windows and a pretty pleasant environment, but definitely not probably where you'd want to look at color. And I can say, where is your viewing booth? And a lot of times at that point, they're going to truck me down into some closet that's, you know, halfway across the building and they'd never go there because it's far away and not pleasant and not near their desk. Um, so that's some of the brands. So that obviously doesn't relate to the store very well. The other ones, I have some who are much, much more organized, like when I was at a few, maybe about a month ago, when I said, where do you look at color? They said, we look in this room. And they said, we believe in this room that our lights are very similar to the store. And uh, and what happened at that customer was, you know, I said, are you sure they are? And, uh, and they said, well, we have five stores right near here. It was a brand that owns like five different brands. And they said, you know, you can go in there and measure it and proceeded to call the store managers and say, if you see a guy walking around measuring lighting, um, you know, he's with us, it's okay. But, you know, they have multiple environments. And then even within a single brand, very often the lighting might be different throughout that brand. So some brands are conscious and try to control it. But many of them, even within, you know, that same single brand uh, don't have the correct lighting. Then other ones may be a product where they don't actually control the store, <clears throat> so they don't control the, the lighting in that case. From the printer side, you know, there's commercial printing in which we're pretty much D50 all the time, hopefully, unless you uh, look at that light bulb over there. That's actually a real printer's viewing booth, which is, uh, and I have a lot of pictures of stuff like that. But uh, when we look at printing, if it's commercial, then they very often have D50. Uh, but sometimes I'll go to printers and they'll actually have store lighting. So I'll walk into a room and they'll flip on a switch and they'll say, this switch is for this store, this switch is for this store, and this switch is for, you know, this this brand or this store. And if you look at which brands get the special treatment, it's the brands who actually control the lighting and ask for it. And, of course, a, a uh, part of that is they have to actually spend enough money to get the printer to do this because it, Printer isn't just going to do custom, you know, proof to press match uh, for every customer they have. It usually involves spending millions and millions of dollars, you know, to get to the level where the printer is going to do this custom treating, but treatment. But when you walk into that little viewing booth at the customer, I'm, the printer I'm thinking of right now, you know, they can flip the lighting on, to simulate the different store conditions, and that's all part of their process. Uh, and then with color management, keep in mind the lighting. You know, that's part of an ICC profile, and by tuning the lighting of the profile with the lighting you're looking at, you can get much more accuracy as well. Uh, if you ask a brand, when I walk into a brand and I ask them, what about the lighting? You know, they may be going into a lot of different stores, or it may be their store, but very often it's inconsistent, and very often they don't actually know the lighting. Keep in mind that the design of the store will actually impact the lighting and the color of the walls and everything like that. And also in the region, what part of the world are they in? Because in the, in the U.S., lighting is one temperature. As you head over to Asia, it becomes 
quite a bit brighter usually in a store. Uh, if you look at the picture here, you know, you can see a pretty big range of uh, lighting here. So on the right, I think that's a Target store, and on the left, that's just like a boutique store. Um, you know, lighting is all over the map if you start to look at it. It's, it's very different. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, is hand it over to Danny Rich and see if you can flip him over so he's the presenter. Okay, uh, so Danny, I just made you the presenter and up in the upper left where it says file, edit, and share, just click share and then my screen. Uh, I think you're on mute still too. I, I'm on mute. Okay. Um, uh, can you hear you now? So, yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay, great. We can see your PowerPoint. There you go. You're perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, Ron asked me to talk a little bit about store lighting versus illuminance, CIE illuminance. So I'm going to walk you through some work. Uh, I've been uh, dealing particularly with uh, modern uh, solid state lighting for about two or three years now, uh, sort of in the background, following what's going on. The CIE has had a lot of activity in this area, uh, mostly related to engineering of these uh, new uh, lamps. Uh, so I, I did a study here. Uh, I was interested primarily in the lower color temperature lamps, the warm white lamps, simply because incandescent lamps are slowly being taken off the market. Uh, they're going away except for very special technical applications uh, and being replaced with uh, these LED based. So uh, these lamps are uh, a blue LED with a yellow phosphor uh, and uh, the form factor that I was interested in here is the MR16 display case lamp, the kind of spot or flood lamps that you'd find in a lot of uh, retail environments. So you can see I selected from a lot of different uh, manufacturers. Uh, these are all fit the same uh, uh, set of uh, pins. They direct in replacements for your incandescent uh, MR16 lamps. But you can, you, you can see that they're all built differently. So everybody uh, that has a, a much different uh, appearance, look, how they're configured and so on. Um, a lot of the uh, the edges there are actually cooling fins. Uh, you know, people say, well, solid state lamps don't have uh, any heat. Well, that's not quite so true. They're electrical devices, and electrical devices aren't 100% efficient. And so any electricity that doesn't go to produce light goes to produce heat. Most of it comes out the back rather than the front. You know, an incandescent lamp produces more heat than it does light. But uh, anyway, so this was uh, the set of lamps that I, that I uh, studied, uh, looked at their, their spectral distributions and characterized them. Uh, I took and measured these lamps. I, I used a Gucci and Hausko OL754 scanning spectral radiometer. This is a very high-end instrument. It's about $50,000. Um, and I made the scans from 300 to 800 nanometers at one nanometer intervals with a bandwidth of two nanometers. I calibrated the instrument against a reference lamp, an OL345RP, with direct traceability to NIST. In fact, the guys at Gooch and Huskow actually worked at NIST once upon a time. So the lamps were all scanned on five separate occasions. Readings were all averaged. Average results from each lamp were normalized by their luminance values, the absolute uh, light output, and then averaged all together. When you do that, uh, averaging to the luminance values, you take out any variations. And this lamp has you know, a few more lumens uh, than the other lamp. By uh, normalizing to the lumen, uh, luminance or lumens, uh, they all come and look very, pretty much the same. So here's uh, some the results of that study. The orange line here, that's an ordinary uh, incandescent lamp. You see that it sort of turns over here on the top. It doesn't look like CIE illuminate A, which just keeps going up, because most real lamps uh, have reflectors that uh, take away some of that. Uh, uh, extra infrared, so it turns over a little bit. So that's your incandescent lamp at 2700 Kelvin. Uh, the red line, this is our warm white LED. 
So you can see it has this sort of double peak. There's the blue LED. There's the yellow phosphor. You can see that there's not a lot of blue LED, a lot of yellow. That's because the link is very uh, strong, and so most of the blue light is being uh, re-emitted as yellow. On the other hand, this green line here, that's a 5,000 Kelvin LED. And so you see there's a lot of blue light, but only a small amount, not of the same yellow, but more of an orangey yellow or a, a greenish yellow here uh, coming out in order to raise the color temperature. Whoops, sorry. Let's get back to where I was here. And uh, the blue line, that's our CIE D50 that we want to to uh, where everybody likes to use in all of the graphic art standards. Now, this also gives us a good shot to see why do we like D50. You'll notice it's almost flat across from about 450 to 700 uh, nanometers. So that means if you're looking at neutral scales, balancing an image, this will give you the most neutral looking image. If I take and I bump the blue end up relative to the red, get something like a D65, my grays will actually look a little bit bluish. If I use something lower, like this incandescent lamp, my grays will look yellowish. With the D5000 type uh, source, I get fairly neutral looking grays. So that's why we like D50. But you know, none of these uh, real sources look like D50. Even the one that has 5000 Kelvin uh, reference doesn't look like 5,000 Kelvin daylight. So I wanted to see how these lamps affect packaging. So I took some packages. Uh, this is a, uh, each of these dots represents a package, and these are real packages. So I went out and collected things, and there's uh, snack packages and food boxes and uh, uh, gum packages, you know, all kinds of different stuff that I could find that were brightly colored. And um, uh, this shows here in the left chart, this is the A star, B star diagram. So this going around in a circle here, that's the hue circle. You can see I've got uh, reds, oranges, yellows, uh, some greens, yellow greens, uh, some cyans, and some purples. So I have a pretty good range of, uh, of hues. Uh, this is the lightness versus uh, uh, A star axis. But you can see most of them are up in this range, not a lot of dark colors. Uh, dark colors tend to soil or burnish easily, so uh, most of your designers aren't going to use uh, those dark colors. We like light and bright colors. So a lot of high chromas, a lot of bright colors. So I picked uh, out of these, I picked five colors to show you here, uh, just uh, what's happening. I have two sets of lines here. Uh, in a is the uh, CIE incandescent lamp. The THL is a real tungsten halogen lamp that we saw earlier. Uh, and uh, then the other is to LED. So this is where CIE Illuminate A plots the color of color number six. This is where the LED plots it. This is where an incandescent lamp plots it. So you can see an incandescent lamp and A are pretty close. That's a very small difference, pretty sizable difference when you go to LED. Uh, similar for color number 12. Now we see it in the opposite direction. This time, uh, it's a little bit bigger difference between A and incandescent for this uh, color. Uh, and now the color is shifting uh, off in the uh, red direction. Color 19, again, pretty small difference here. Big difference up into the yellow-orange. Here's one, the uh, uh, incandescent lamp uh, versus in, uh, in, uh, luminate A is moving in this direction, a very short distance. And the LED is taken in a completely opposite direction. Color 24, same kind of thing we see again. So I put together a summary chart. Uh, this is for uh, D50, uh, because that's what we're really interested in. Uh, this is uh, LED 5000 Kelvin that we saw earlier versus CIE D50 on uh, these uh, 26 colors. Uh, the minimum color difference, the smallest difference was 3.7, and the max, these are CIE DE 2000, uh, or uh, some, sorry, C Lab differences, uh, was 3.7, and the maximum was 20.1. Somewhere around eight uh, units, it stops being a color difference and starts being a different color. 
So whatever, uh, if this was the, the package design, whatever it looked like under D5000, it's a completely different color under D50 uh, LED. And that's what I had to share. Great, thank you. Um, if I can get how back often to you. in your business, in, in your business, Danny? How often do they do you get involved in an actual brand trying to figure that stuff out with your inks and stuff? Uh, yeah, uh, myself personally, uh, not very often. Uh, we have a whole division of the company called Global Color Management, and they do work directly with the brands on some of these issues. Yeah, that's great. So we'll have questions in a little while. Um, okay, yeah. Jim. All right, Jim, I just handed you, just handed you the control. And um, in the upper left where it says File, Edit, Share, um, you want to just click Share and then My Screen. Uh, I think you're on mute still, too. I believe, can you hear me now? Uh, oh, yes, yep. we can hear you fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I just I'm I'm using the dial in because I I think I had oh, a little right. trouble with the connection before. Mm -hmm. So I share yep. my screen. Make sure I got the right monitor for you there. Yep. Um, Mine just went black. <laughs> yeah. Maybe switch to the other monitor. There, it's coming back. Do you have? Yes, we see your PowerPoint. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Great. And it's it's full screen? Um, for that size or that type, yeah, it's full screen, and uh, we should be able to see that fine. Uh, otherwise, for folks on the call, you can also kind of zoom in, too. There's some controls in the upper right of your screen to zoom in if you need to. Uh, and you'll get a recording, too. So, Jim, I think we're, we're all set for you. Very good. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it, Steve. And Ron, thank you again. And, and Danny, it's, it's a pleasure working with you guys. Um, it's, uh, there's, it, I think it's rare that you have a level of, of expertise that we've got on the call where you can look at um, both the practical out in the field. I think Danny did a great job of summarizing, in particular, what you actually see based on lighting differences. Um, there's a small amount of overlap with some of what I chose to share with you today, but I, I thought I'd uh, share based on our experiences a little bit about what we practically see in the in lighting environments versus production environments. So uh, my name is James Summers. I'm responsible for um, two divisions of our company. One builds luminaires or light booths, lighting conditions, uh, used for production environments, so graphic arts and uh, other production environments. And the other division works in building instrumentation. So I thought I'd, I'd say, talk a little bit about both of those. Um, on the use side of our business, we manufacture a wide variety of lighting booths used for everything from capturing original photographic images to desktop viewing, large format viewing, uh, samples and actual product comparisons and garments and a variety of different uh, industry sectors. And then on the light measurement side, uh, Danny mentioned he's using a spectroradiometer. Our, our company also builds um, similar instruments uh, used for both measuring um, lighting conditions used in graphic arts applications, but all, they're also quite frequently used by lighting manufacturers. So we get this opportunity to kind of, if you will, eat our own dog food. We, we get to manufacture lights and make sure they do what we say they're supposed to do. But it also gives us a unique opportunity to look in a variety of different industry sectors at how this affects color and its color appearance. And we do that with a variety of different customers around the world. So most of you are here because you already know uh, lighting dramatically affects your brands and color. Uh, both in terms of quality and consistency. And more importantly, it, it definitely affects our customers' experience and their satisfaction with brands as well. The, the customer is going to have an idea, a perception based on where and how they see the product originally and based on where they're purchasing it as well. And then some experience when they get it home and hopefully it's not a disappointing one. So our purpose is to help reinforce the consistency 
uh, in terms of the expectation of how color is going to look in the end customer environment. Um, sometimes I, I found lately that people get those two environments confused, and I think Ron did a good job of, of illustrating those differences. We talk about one lighting used within the brand production workflow, so the packaging, the point of purchase, the point of sale, all, all the printed sort of materials and also online viewed materials in the graphic arts workflow, and that is to a D50 standard, it's to an ISO standard that, that references D50. Um, it can be from a variety of different sources, most often today fluorescent tubes or in uh, case of, of some other equipment, LED based. Um, it's not often measured or controlled uh, with a lot of companies. The better companies do follow the standard and measure it well. But we're also talking today about lighting within the brand workflow, and that's a completely different animal, as we've said, and I think uh, have illustrated that it can be quite different from the lighting in our workflow environment. Danny mentioned a little bit about this and, and some really great examples of actual lights. Um, this is the CIE D65 illuminant. So we were talking earlier about the 50 D50 illuminant. So uh, just a little bit of note on illuminants versus lights. Uh, an illuminant is an artificial definition of light. It's, it's not real light, but it's a uh, definition that's accepted as a certain type of light. So a D65 is a bluer light uh, than a D50. It uh, has more energy down here in, in this, this sector of wavelengths, um, say below about 450 nanometers on the chart. And this is the power on the left-hand scale and the wavelength visible light being about 400 to about 700 nanometers. So as we mentioned before and Ron mentioned, uh, there is energy below in this blue and ultraviolet portion of the spectrum as part of the both D50 and D65 illuminant definitions. And it's important because it is there and it does excite things like optical brighteners and fluorescent inks and other things like this which greatly influence what we see. And if that same energy is not in the lighting that we have within the store environment, then we're going to see colors quite differently. This is an example of the green line superimposed over that D65 illuminant. And this is what it would look like, uh, the, it's called the spectral power distribution curve, what it would look like in comparison uh, of a fluorescent lamp versus a D65. Uh, standard CIE illuminant. And as you can see, we call these the spikes. It's a very spiky source, whereas the CIE illuminant is a very even, nice, smooth uh, power source. So you can imagine if we have these spikes, depending on where they line up with the different colorants and pigments we have in our reproduction, we will see color quite differently. And this further one is an example of a very high CRI, not a typical store environment. Um, LED lighting, and you can see it is also spiky, but has spikes in different locations than the fluorescent light. So just as a general statement, you can see it's no wonder that when we look at different color samples under these different types of illuminants, we'll have a different appearance. I thought I'd talk about four key things that, that I've seen impacting brands with respect to retail lighting and its correspondence to the production lighting. So one, the lighting that actually ends up in the retail environment is typically based on decisions other than light quality. It's most often based on the capital cost of those fixtures, and more importantly these days, uh, based on the operating cost of those fixtures, how much energy they consume in the retail environment. So quite often it's not actually based on how those lights are going to make the products that we're printing or being responsible for reproducing in hard copy or other packaging forms, uh, it's not, not a, the primary goal is not to make those look good, it's for other factors. When light quality is considered, I find quite often that the metrics that folks using in the retail and brand presentation environment are not uh, very good metrics or they're very limited metrics, and we'll talk about those in a second. The third major factor that I've seen is the transformation that LED lighting is creating. 
It's a rapid transformation and LED lighting is fundamentally different. So the decisions, again, being based on energy efficiencies more than color reproduction. And the last point we talked about a little bit earlier uh, was that the packaging environment, lighting and production is going to be our D50, but we really may not know what the retail environment lighting is. So who, who are the drivers behind making these decisions in the retail environment for that lighting? Well, um, kind of at the one end of the spectrum, it may be maintenance staff actually just replacing lights or fluorescent tubes. It could be some of the operations people thinking a little bit more about efficiency. It might be an architect doing a new building design or a new lighting or presentation uh, planogram design. Uh, if it's a little bit better, the merchandisers might get involved and say, hey, we know certain colors will render well under different lights. It could be the product or brand manager trying to maintain some consistency. Or as we kind of go up the food chain, it might be the CEO making a strategic decision, a, a chief financial officer making a financial system decision, uh, a marketing officer thinking more about the branding, or as I would say, a, ch a chief uh, officer that doesn't really know. Um, and no disrespect to them, but they have a different set of objectives than color rendering and color appearance. And all of them are kind of involved in this food chain on the right-hand side from the initial raw materials and dyes and colorants and pigments, uh, inks that go into what we're working with, all the way down to the consumer environment. And when that lighting actually gets implemented, we may see yet another series of players involved. So anywhere from the people that actually design the lighting fixtures themselves and manufacture them, to lighting architects, frequently hired by a building architect to do specialty lighting, all the way through the contractors and installers, energy efficiency companies. I've run into this quite recently where uh, one of our customers was very proud they had retrofitted their entire production facility with LED-based lighting and had saved themselves 50% on their energy costs and were concerned because they were having a significantly higher level of rejects off their manufacturing line. And it didn't take very long to figure out why. And that new LED lighting that they had just installed had a color rendering index, a CRI of less than 80. So they had actually decreased their light quality while improving their lighting efficiency. So sometimes these two objectives work against each other. The kind of metrics that folks will be involved in lighting, making decisions, will depend. The metrics that they use, it kind of depends where on this food chain from research and development all the way through codes and implementations and installation and the maintenance staff, where they fall in that food chain. And they may not be the same. So I thought I'd, I'd put up and just compare a little bit on the typical metrics that we use in lighting measurement in, say, an ISO 3664 standard viewing condition used within graphic arts versus some of the standards they may or may not use in a retail environment. So top of, top of the line in terms of things driving decisions uh, on lighting metrics is efficacy or efficiency uh, for the retail environment. So they're, they're looking for how much energy, how much light energy do they get out of a fixture versus the total amount of energy that's input to it. And LED lighting, for example, will give them the efficiencies of this 120 lumens per watt, uh, whereas in the ISO specification, we don't even specify how efficient it needs to be. We only talk about other uh, metrics, most specifically the, the color quality and the lighting consistency. There's an, another factor called flicker, and flicker is the pulsation of light that you'll see uh, typical in old fluorescent tubes when they're wearing out or when the magnetic ballasts are wearing out. But you also see flicker in new LED-based lighting depending on how it's being driven. And there's very little standardization in this area yet. We, we've done quite a bit of work with Philips and a number of uh, the Department of Energy and other groups to define and measure flicker. Uh, we have seen the state of California, which tends to be a leader in energy efficiency areas, 
starting to specify what level of flicker is acceptable in new lighting fixtures. So um, I expect that we'll, we'll see that as a standard in the retail environment, um, and I think graphic arts would never really accept, accept any level of flicker. So, uh, but we're likely to see that for fixtures in, in graphic arts fixtures, uh, that specification in graphic arts fixtures in the future as well. Very big difference in illuminance level of what we expect for doing critical color comparisons in ISO versus retail. Retail, uh, we have a great spec in, in ISO which talks about not only this illuminance level, but all these other factors from illuminance level down in terms of exactly what we accept to match the D50 standard that we're working to in graphic cards. Whereas in the retail environment, many of these factors are either not used or not commonly used, and there's no standard that the industry has agreed in terms of what is acceptable in the retail environment. So while we are controlling many of these lighting metrics at a very precise level for our viewing conditions in production, these variables either may not be controlled or the, the levels of which they find acceptable are completely different depending on the company, the particular store, and how it's managed. So um, just gives you a feel. I don't want to dig too far down into each of them. We can come back during Q&A if you'd like to talk about them. But I just thought understanding some of those contrasts between the different metrics and how they're used in production versus retail would help understand some of these differences that we see. One factor in this uh, that you'll commonly run into is color correlated color temperature, or degrees Kelvin. Um, it's a common metric. You see it on the light bulbs that you buy in the store. It's listed right on the side, uh, but it's not a very good metric in terms of specifying color. It's a very rough definition. It only is one number. It defines the white point of light, and it's pretty impre imprecise. I'll show you why. In fact, it's so imprecise it's not even part of the ISO standard. Um, in this chart, you can get an idea. These, these are called lines of constant color temperature, constant correlated color temperature, plotted on a chromaticity chart. And this line of 5,000 Kelvin going up here from this greenish yellow area down all the way into a purplish area, every single color along that line is 5,000 Kelvin. So you can see 5,000 Kelvin doesn't really tell you the color of the light, it just tells you a metric called color temperature of the light. And this X right in the middle there is where our D50, very precisely defined, would fall along that metric. So if you had your nice booth operating at D50 and your customer happened to have just a CCT specified of 5,000, he could be anywhere from up here in the upper left to the lower right. Uh, and you both, in theory, would be looking at the same color temperature. So yes, it is the same color temperature, but very different light qualities. That circle here on this envir in this environment shows the uh, tolerance level that the um, ISO 3664 specification allows for D50. So you can see we're in a much more controlled environment than typically is done in retail. Another factor that we use in light quality to help define it a little bit better is called the color rendering index, or the CRI. And for that, in the ISO specification, we use eight different color samples that the instruments compare your lighting condition or the measured lighting condition to the D50 standard, and then uh, has a score going from up to 100, 100 being perfect, averages all those samples, and that gives you a, a rendering average. Well, you can guess that in packaging, as we saw earlier with Danny's really good example, we're, we're dealing with a lot more than eight colors that we were concerned about. And so limiting uh, an evaluation of a light source to just eight samples is pretty restrictive. And for this reason, you'll start seeing a metric much more commonly uh, in the lighting industry, but we'll roll into ours as well uh, with a, uh, the new Illuminant uh, references using the IES TM30 standards called TM30 or you see TM3015. And that expands the number of samples used for a type of CRI calculation to 100. So the good news is that our metrics are improving uh, substantially as we move ahead. 
I thought I'd talk for a minute about, you know, why is LED kind of problematic and, and so different? Uh, we heard before that, you know, how, how they make light is pretty different. We have these phosphors that are being excited by a, what we call a pump diode, a diode that's in the blue specter, and, and then we use additional diodes or addition, additional um, phosphors to create the other colors. But how they make light, what kind of light they produce, how it's emitted from the fixture, how we drive them or power them, and how they change, excuse me for a second, go backwards one, how they change over time is really different between these sources. The kind of a gross illustration on the right hand side, tungsten actually generates more heat than it does light. Fluorescent generates somewhere kind of in the middle and LEDs produce more light than they do heat. But you can also see an LED emits light very differently, different direction than our fluorescent tube, which is emitting in 360 degrees, and the spectrum is quite different as well. So thinking of retrofitting LEDs into an existing fluorescent fixture is not a very good idea because those fixtures were never designed for a source like LED. But you'll find that frequently in some of the retail environments as well. So not only will the source itself influence it, but the fixture that it's placed in has quite a bit of influence as well. So we see LED is a, it's a big game changer. It's about twice as efficient as a good fluorescent fixture. So you can see why those decisions from many executives in retail and brand environments is driving this change. They want to save half the electric bill that they're currently paying. Um, it also helps save on heating and air conditioning because LEDs generate comparatively low, a low level of heat versus, say, a tungsten in particular, and also versus fluorescent fixtures. They have a very long service life. You don't have to change them out. They're comparatively stable over time, and they have no toxic mercury like we have in a fluorescent tube. On the other side, kind of weighing this, this is that, uh, as Danny was showing you a little bit earlier, that blue pump diode, and then this is the phosphors re-emitting light, and then the background is our D50 standard. We've got really different light quality. So the light quality of initial LED fixtures and the inexpensive ones is usually quite poor. Um, it's down in the color rendering index of about 80, which may be actually less than the fluorescent lights that it's replacing today. Um, often the light distribution is quite different, so the way, how the angle that it emits from a fixture. So that fixture design becomes pretty critical in terms of having even illumination throughout a store. Um, the driver electronics will determine how, what kind of flicker it has. Um, I'm not going to dig into angular color uniformity, but suffice it to say there are fringes around an LED which can have a little bit different color quality than the beam in the center. And there's quite a bit of production variability when people are manufacturing the fixtures. As a result of all those things and the comparative newness of them, we're seeing a lot of change in the industry. So there's an education process and there's an evolution of products, which we're right in the middle of right now. And therefore, understanding it a little bit better is quite helpful. So net for net, what, what can you do on the packaging side to, to help um, work better with your brands and, and understand what they're doing? Well, first of all, you know, have your in-house systems in good order. Follow the ISO standard, specify it that you use it or your suppliers to you use it, uh, conform to it, me measure it, monitor it, and uh, if you want to see how your products are going to look in the store lighting, at least do the minimum of viewing them under multiple different illuminant or lighting conditions. With your customers, uh, communicate and educate. So if they're talking about their lighting as just one color temperature, that's not enough. A measured spectrum of that light or certainly additional uh, light metrics would be quite useful. Ideally, measure their environment, and if you can, as we heard earlier, Duplicate at that environment if it's possible. There's nothing better than, than the exact same lighting that your customer has, both lighting level, light distribution, and light quality, to predict how the colors that you've reproduced under D50 will look in their environment. In the real world, we find in terms of actual production environments uh, quite a bit of variance. Uh, as Ron showed you in his before, this is one of uh, uh, one of the ones I took during a lighting audit, there are four different color tubes in this one fixture. So in many production environments, people don't monitor their systems. 
Uh, they'll use fluorescent tubes way beyond their useful life, which is about 2,500 hours. Um, in a big change that's been taking recently is ambient lighting conditions are not well monitored. Um, this is really important because the whole efficiency that LEDs offer in, in store lighting is also following us right into the production room. So out in the warehouse, in the shop floor, maybe in the bindery area, the stacking area, and all the areas around a press that are lit outside of the precious color booth that someone might have, getting switched over to LED, and oftentimes it's brighter. And that LED light, if it's not of proper quality, will contaminate the color critical viewing areas and thereby affect color judgments considerably. So part of what we do in a good lighting audit is not only measure the color booth or the color critical viewing area, but also all the conditions around it, the ambient lighting conditions. And some, some cases uh, that misunderstanding what the, the quality of the LEDs going into that ambient lighting is, as well as some people actually doing retrofits into their viewing booth, not, not understanding the color quality of those replacement tubes. In the real world, the, the kind of stuff that we see uh, and most often causing problems in, in light booths out in production environments, um, this is some data I worked on with, with David Hunter from his Chromachector pilot marketing tool, and it's a sample of 60 light booths out, out in the field. Of those 60 light booths that were sampled, a full 64% of them failed the ISO viewing conditions. So it gives you an idea, you know, in the real world, there's, there's a lot more variants out there than you might think. And the top reasons for them failing uh, were varied, but this is, you know, anywhere from the metameric index, which is quite important to us because that's going to affect how well we see color changes based on different viewing conditions, different lighting conditions, and then down to the overall lighting level, the illuminance level, the uniformity, which affects our ability to see tints and tint progressions quite considerably, as well as chromaticity and rendering indices. So um, it it's, demonstrates why it's important to monitor and audit and maintain your, your viewing environment. So where we see this kind of heading uh, over time, um, incandescent and fluorescent lighting will rapidly be going away. Already in the state of California, if you do a building retrofit or new building construction based on their Title 24 code, building code, you can't replace that lighting with incandescent or fluorescent. It doesn't say it has to be LED, but if you read between the lines, the only kind of efficiency that you can get that's enough to meet those standards will be LED-based lighting. So as a leader in uh, energy efficiency laws and regulations, I think we'll see much of the rest of the country follow suit with them. So there will be a time in the near future where LED or whatever the next generation of lighting is uh, will be ubiquitous. Um, we'll also see considerable continued improvements in performance of LED fixtures in particular since they're the, the current generation of replacement uh, uh, lighting technology. So that means we'll have more lumens or more light output per watt. We'll see better quality light, those color rendering indexes and the things that make uh, us able to judge color well will continue to improve, and there'll be more choices in terms of fixtures and different configurations so that we can have the kind of spot lighting and uh, overall ambient lighting and the, the type of uh, focused, very controlled lighting in a, in a retail environment that helps highlight products. And further, we'll continue to see the evolution of those fixtures such that they're self-monitoring and reporting and connected and smart. So I, I think there's a, if you will excuse the pun, a, a bright future. So thanks. Uh, I'm <laughs> done with that portion, and I'll turn it back over. Yep. Steve, if you can flip it to me, and uh, now we can take questions. That was always interesting, and I look forward to LED making life better just in terms of uh, what we see in our viewing booths right now. It's my big hope. <laughs> yep. All right, Ron, the so, cool. is coming to you. Yeah, and uh, we are ready for questions. Oh, okay, good. Uh, we, so if you have a question, just type it in the chat box. You can send it to one of the presenters or send it directly to me, the host, and 
I'll, I'll uh, cover them uh, or ask them. We did have a couple of questions coming to me, uh, so we'll start with that. Um, and actually, there was a question, uh, Jim, during your presentation towards the beginning, and there was a question about, uh, you know, why did you choose to use D65 as the standard instead of D50? So um, we, we use D50 as the standard for graphic arts viewing conditions just as, as specified by ISO 3664. I just chose D65 um, for this presentation because it's one of the more common aluminum standards that's used in textiles, um, industrial products. It's not as common in, in retail environments, I, re I recognize that, but I, I knew, also knew our other presenters were going to be talking about D50, so I, I just thought I'd share, there, there's a couple of different um, color temperature and lighting standards that are used in retail environments, and really just to illustrate the difference. Great. Uh, another question during your presentation, Jim, so maybe you want to take this one too, is do LED lights fade? over time before they fail, or do they just burn out? Without really good question. Um, they typically tend to, like most solid state devices, they, they're kind of binary. They tend to, to fail completely. However, related to that, and a really important thing, is depending on how those LED uh, modules are implemented, their performance may change significantly over time. Uh, and I mean a short period of time. So, for example, um, Danny's um, presentation showed those fins, the radiating fins, to dissipate heat. LED, both their color temperature as well as their light output shifts markedly with temperature. And if there's not good thermal management, you know, heat sinks and things like that, uh, cooling fins in the high output fixtures, um, then you, as soon as you fire them up, their output will start shifting dramatically. So in really good fixtures, there's uh, thermal management inside of them as well. But, but most typically, LEDs usually have a, a, an immediate 100% failure. Some of them will dim, but most often they just fail, very much unlike uh, fluorescent tubes. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is, uh, well, open to anybody, is, the challenge of producing a single shelf product that will be sold in various retailers, none no retailers match the other, uh, the endpoint use has no standard in place. Uh, the real the question is, is there any initiative to suggest a standard lighting setup for products in a retail environment? Do you, so, do I, you I, I don't know. Yeah, in? yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I don't know of any uh, work at the moment for standardizing lighting in the retail. What we're seeing on uh, more early adopters from the places like the textile uh, uh, and uh, department store is to actually um, work with the, the lighting engineers and to specify uh, the, uh, the lighting that's going in based on some predetermined uh, concepts and then to maintain that. So each store will, may still be different, but uh, you know they, they are, their differences are, are constrained more than they are today. I mean, today it's everybody goes out and they buy whatever tube that uh, fluorescent uh, uh, tube they want they can find for the cheapest price they can find. And unfortunately, the manufacturing of those tubes is exactly the same way. They, they take a big bundle of glass and they. They spray oil on the some oil, kind of oil on the inside, and they just pour the powder through it. They catch what doesn't stick to the walls on the other end, and recycle it for the next group of tubes. So it's very variable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'd add too it, within LEDs. Um, if you ever want to see what the level of LEDs as a manufacturing process inherently have quite a bit of drift when they're when they're manufactured, and there's a selection process called binning where where they're selectively monitored as they come off the production line to try to control some of that variability. But but the net for net is both in the sources, the so LED or fluorescent. There's quite a bit of variance in the products that are out in the marketplace. But back to the question wh whether that impacts what you actually have as a standard in the retail environment, 
I have seen nothing where there's a consolidated effort in the industry to come up with a single uh, or even a group of retail lighting standards. Uh, and there's kind of a similar question around that. Uh, what was, Paimo, what are the key takeaways, or I guess I would insert the word best practices, in regard to achieving color consistency when product lighting conditions are all over the map? until the worldwide LED overhaul, that is what was written. So I don't know, any comments on that? Like what do you do, I guess it sounds like? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things is that if your brand color is really important to your uh, products, and most brand colors are, but I, uh, and some, some more than others, you know, things come to my mind are things like, um, you know, uh, Cadbury's purple or, or uh, Craft uh, or um, not craft, um, yeah, craft blue, Kodak yellow, those kind of things where it's really iconic in the color. Then uh, what you want to, to uh, probably do is to set specifications not just on uh, the uh, D50 color, but to set specifications on how much that color can vary as you go from source to source. So uh, uh, basically, a kind of a metamorphism uh, index of uh, some kind. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, Danny, what are you are you saying then um, at, for the brand managers? Then they could pick a different formulation, for example, of, of an ink that might have better metameric properties than some other formulations. Well, certainly the ink makers can 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 do that for you. So if you tell them, you know, I, I want it to be, you know, this set of LABs under uh, D50, and when it's displayed, Displayed under uh, incandescent or 3,000 or 2,700 Kelvin LED or under outdoor conditions D65, how, wherever it's going to be used, you know, I, I want a, a set of numbers that represent that. They will then uh, do their best to match the spectral signature of uh, that information so that it's always the generates those set of coordinates, uh, minimizes mm -hmm. the, the differences. Now, you know, there are some some methods they call this color constancy. There are some methods for maximizing color constancy, but unfortunately color constancy methods don't work very well for high chroma colors. They do pretty well for, you know, uh, medium to low chroma colors, but not so much for high chroma colors. And the, the only, uh, only thing I, I would add from a, from a lighting perspective is the, so if, if if you have a specific set of pigments that you're working with or colorants that you're working with in the different printing processes, uh, because we, we know they're going to be having a mixture of flexo and offset, and both web and sheet, and probably some digital print in there too, um, the only way that you're going to actually be able to see what the, what the impact is is to, to duplicate the lighting environments that uh, it's going to be viewed in. Or at least, as I was saying earlier, you know, look at it under multiple different illuminants so you can get an idea of how it's going to change when the viewing conditions change. Exactly. Yep. And very, so some of the, the booth, idea. yeah, the booth, one of the booths that uh, James uh, showed had three sections where each section had a slightly different uh, appearance in his slide it was because each section had a different source. And so you can put your product in there side by side and see them. Uh, the textile guys used to like to have the booth where it had multiple sources and they had a foot pedal and they could flip the foot pedal between the different sources so they could hold the textile out in, in, the, in their hands and change the lighting on the fly and see how much the, the color shifted as you went from, from one source to another. Now the problem is you need to be careful about is that when you do that your eye isn't adapted to the new source. It's adapted to the old source. So uh, you're going to see a bigger change than will actually happen uh, in, under uh, normal lighting conditions, normal viewing conditions. So the, the, the belief, the thinking here is that if that flare, they call it, if that flare is, is acceptable uh, to you, then it should almost always be acceptable to people under the normal viewing conditions. Okay, so we're we're right yeah. approaching the end of our time. We got a couple more questions, so maybe this could be the quick lightning round for Q and A okay. answers here. <laughs> <laughs> so Great. The lightning round is uh, 
when when you dim LED lights, does color shift like incandescent? So it Good depends question. on on the lighting design. Um, in a properly designed fixture with proper dimming controls, you should not see any color shift. Um, if it's a single illuminate kind of co commercial fixture, um, most often you actually do see a little bit of shift, but significantly less than what you see with um, dimming of either tungsten or fluorescent. Yeah, it's a, the, the LEDs are binary uh, and the, they don't turn on until you reach a certain voltage threshold and once you reach that threshold, then the electrons automatically flow. So uh, it, it's pretty hard to, to, to dim them except by turning them on and off. And, and, and as Jim pointed out, sometimes you get some sort of fringes uh, and turning them on and off will sometimes shift their color a little bit as they go on and off, on and off. Uh, and then a couple, just two more questions here that I see in here real quick. Uh, and just so everybody knows, we'll get a recording of the presentation too, in case you join later, everybody does get a full recording. And the question is, um, would it be more appropriate to reduce the UV amount in the D50 norm light definition, especially with OBA substrates? <laughs> This is the oh, old that's UV an interesting one, huh, guys? <laughs> so, yeah. so the, that's nothing, nothing to do with solid state lighting. <laughs> yeah, the, the ISO standard actually changed in 2000, between the 2000 and the 2009 standard, uh, to include UV, whereas in 2000 mm -hmm. we consciously excluded UV. And the, and the whole reason it was done was to be able to see the impact of OBAs um, and other types of fluorescing agents and inks and, and substrates. So uh, <laughs> it'd be hard yeah. to say. I, I, I mean, Ron's point was a really good one. There's not as much UV in most typical store lighting, uh, but to take it all away, then I, we wouldn't see any impact uh, of the substrates. Yeah, my whole so, dream, I think... <laughs> my whole dream, which I'll just speak for 10 seconds, the whole dream would be that it would go somewhere halfway back to where it was. Um, but that's a, only a big, big dream, which Danny's heard me talk about. And uh, and yeah. my my dream would be that it was didn't have as much UV energy as it has now. As they go through LEDs, they start to look at all that, and somehow, sometime in five years, they change it. Yeah, well, one, one LED manufacturer has taken a challenge on this and uh, has actually patented, so he may, they may be the only ones that that issue these. Uh, instead of the blue LED that we saw, that blue LED has very little uh, ultraviolet in it. it. Stimulates almost nothing from a, uh, OBA. Uh, but this other company has put violet LEDs, at the 395 to 405 range. And so it generates a lot of OBA emission. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and well, let's take one last question here and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. And since we're a little bit over is, um, uh, which is uh, considering the limited value of reading a lighting condition of an environment as a single Kelvin value, is there a practical or affordable way that a print provider could do their own readings that would take into account the color reproduction index? Yes, yes. There, there are a number of different spectrometers available for measuring, it, they, they measure spectral distribution and then they go and calculate rendering indices, uh, UV, metameric indices, and a, and a variety of other factors. So um, yep. af affordable is probably a relative term because that's not a $100 yes. <laughs> instrument. It's a, you know, several thousands of dollars, but um, it's quite possible. The, uh, you know, the, yes, this is a common problem, so there's a, Babel Color makes this uh, little teeny tiny tool that is not a real spectro radiometer or anything like that. It uses an I1, but at least gives a little bit of a clue where you are. It's not legit, it's not what you can certify with, but it gives you a, you know, kind of a ballpark. I'm way out to lunch or I'm, you know, close to okay. So I, that's not what you'd use for ISO level type stuff, but that's one that you could use as a, you know, as a practitioner just in your plant, what am I doing booth to booth and, is it completely, completely out to lunch? And that software is about 150 bucks and 
works with the I1. And I1 is by no means what you're supposed to use for color, but for lighting, but but uh, that's one way that, that some people do it. Yeah, I've seen similar software which would use uh, FD7 from Minolta, Konica Minolta as well. Yeah, that's a better device for it, for sure, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, Ron, I'll turn it over to you for the last word here. Uh, just a quick little thing yeah. for everybody. Uh, reminder that the, uh, the uh, recording will come out. I'll watch for that from Tim Beckley, who, who is, uh, uh, is our Vice President of Workflows here at Idea Alliance. He's traveling. Uh, we're opening up a brand new office in Thailand. Uh, we're just growing internationally by leaps and bounds. It's very exciting. And so look for that in a few days, the recording. And uh, I wanted to personally say thank you to all our, our guests who were on today, our attendees, and to Ron, Danny, and uh, uh, Jim for really just a, a great presentation. And, and I was just so glad to hear somebody say that we had a bright future. Uh, I thought that was, just, you know, that along with metamorphism are two of my favorite lighting words. Uh, so with that, I'll turn over yeah. to Ron for the wrap up uh, and wrap up our, you know, whatever else you have to share here. Let's look on the screen and, and kind of wrap up for us. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, just echoing what you said. Thank you very much, Danny and Jim, for taking the time and sharing what you guys know because you know some pretty interesting things that most of us, you know, we wonder about and don't know. So. The knowledge you guys have, we appreciate your sharing it as well as your time and preparing for this. And then for everybody else, have a great weekend. Uh, and, you know, we'll be back in next month with another brand topic. If you have topics, you can send them in to us that you're interested in. But we'll be back next month and we'll have our next live training. will be somewhere in September and we're working on our locations. But we actually have two different sites, probably on both sides of the country and, and uh, moving forward with that. So thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. And, mm -hmm. Appreciate your attending and take care. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. That concludes our webinar for today. Quick shout out to Brian, who said the presentation was very illuminating. Nice. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Have a great weekend. And with that, we'll conclude our webinar for today. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, okay. Live long and render well. Ha, 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 ha.